Eleven. New Edinburgh Spaceport, Caledonia, Sky March, Federated Commonwealth, twelve hundred thirty hours, thirty first of March, thirty fifty seven. At the nadir jump point of the Gladius star system, Alex and McCall had made their connection with the Neptune, an AFFC transport en route to neighboring Layaka, with space available for two handoff passengers from the Altair. Three days later, they made the jump to Layaka, where, after several days of negotiations with the rather seedy-looking owner-captain of the independent freighter Shoshone, they were accepted as passengers and taken aboard for the hyperspace passage to Caledon. The Shoshone's dropship Tagalong took Alex and McCall on their final leg of the voyage, touching down at New Edinburgh Spaceport on a fiery shaft of white-hot plasma. As she settled into the port's number five grounding pit, it took less than an hour for Alex and McCall to pass through the obligatory customs check, to pick up the baggage, and to make arrangements for McCall's special freight consignment to be stored in a local warehouse after being offloaded from the Tagalong's cargo hold. It was just past local noon when they were ready to find transport to the home of McCall's family in Dundee. Caledonia's day was similar enough to Terra's in length that it used the same twenty-four hour clock, with an extra fifty-three minutes added after local midnight. New Edinburgh, as the planet's capital, designated the Terra Mean time zone, just as on Glengarry. The riot, they learned later, had already been going on for most of the day. I'm sorry, gentlemen. The heavily armed and armored trooper told them, just inside the exit from the spaceport terminal, "It's not safe to go out on the streets today. You should try getting a room at the spaceport hotel until things quiet down." Alex looked back at the crowd already thronging the terminal lounge, hundreds of people occupying every available chair or bench, and many sitting in disconsolate clusters in out-of-the-way corners of the carpeted floors. It seemed unlikely that there would be any hotel rooms vacant. Not that McCall was in any mood to be delayed. Lade, he said cheerfully, drawing a fifty-caliber Starfire, the handgun he favored as a sidearm. After coming all this way, I'll nay be turned away from my own home by rabble. Step aside now. It might have been the small hand cannon McCall was holding, or it could have been something in the heavily accented voice. The young trooper started to speak, then shrugged and waved them through. If that's the way you want it, fellow, it's your funeral. The soldier, Alex noted, was wearing the black and yellow livery of Caledonia's Home Guard, a militia regiment under the direct command of the planet's governor. As the two of them stepped through sliding doors and into the cool afternoon air outside, Alex commented about it to McCall. That soldier back there, aye, they call them black jackets here. A vicious little so and so. He didn't sound like you. No Scots burr. Aye, you noticed that, did ye? Not all Caledonians have the same rich command of the language as the old families. Still, true enough, he sounded like an outlander to me, imported most likely. Imported by who? His Majesty the Governor, of course. The poor wee man has trouble finding support among the natives, so now he has to send for hired help. Ah, watch yourself now, Alex. This could get interesting. The spaceport rose from a flat plain on the outskirts of New Edinburgh. In a depressed-looking district of run-down housing, ramshackle warehouses, and bulk storage centers and manufacturing facilities, Alex could see the silver-white ribbons of elevated highways rising above the slums and cheap fabriplas constructs in the distance, but there were few ground cars in evidence. A subway station faced the entrance to the spaceport across a rubbish-littered park. A mob was issuing from the station doors and into the park's central plaza. Some armed with clubs or improvised weapons, most unarmed. Numerous signs were visible above the angry, shouting heads. Alex saw several with the word 
murderers, scrawled in the red paint to mimic blood. This way, lad, McCall said, nudging him with an elbow. His hands were full, one holding the pistol, the other his ship case, but he managed to steer Alex nonetheless, leading him away from the street fronting the park and down a side alley running along the spaceport's perimeter fence. The crowd, growing second by second, continued to spill into the park, overflowing the plaza and occupying most of the bare ground that had once been grass beyond. One of the mob's leaders had sprung onto an improvised podium, the pedestal of a bronze statue rising from the plaza center. She was a young woman, Alex noted, with long brown hair held back from her face by a red headband. She wore plaid shoes and a t-shirt with the clenched fist emblem of the Steiners. Citizens, she called out, her voice amplified by some unseen sound system. Caledonians, our rights and liberties have been first trampled and then taken away, until we are little better than slaves to Wilmarf and his cronies. Alex would have liked to hear more, but their path suddenly jinked left behind the warehouse, muffling the woman's voice to unintelligible booms and thumps from the amplifier bass circuits. The thunderous roar of approval as the crowd cheered something she'd said still followed them clearly. I would like to hear what the lass has to say myself, McCall told Alex as they hurried along the alley, but I think it will be best if we not associate ourselves with the likes of them at the moment. I'm sure you're right. They took several more turns in rapid succession, weaving a confusing trail throughout a labyrinth of storage buildings. Oh, you do know where we're going, Major, don't you? Lad, this place has seen no growth or new construction in years. I played in these alleyways as a bairn full fifty years ago now. Really? My father said you were from a rich family here, and you were playing in the alleys? Aye, that I was. I was a bit of a rebel even then. Came down here every chance I could, to watch the dropships come and go. There was something romantic about those great round ships climbing to the stars on their pillars of white flame back then. Here we are. Watch your head. He dragged back a loose section of chain-link fence, opening a narrow way through. Alex squeezed through into yet another alley, whose far end opened onto a dirty, trash-littered street. He could hear the troops coming long before he saw them. McCall had holstered his pistol and set down the bag. Let's wait a bit, Alex, he said. Look friendly and peaceful, a harmless tourist. They stood at the mouth of the alley as the armored column swept past, twelve open-topped hovercraft racing one after the other down the street, on shrill, shrieking, ducted fans. The wind howling from beneath their skirts set litter and trash in the street whirling, and pelted both men with showers of fine, air-blasted grit and cinders. The soldiers riding those troop carriers were black-armored, their faces invisible behind polarized helmet blast shields, but Alex could see their incurious glances as they passed. Behind him, McCall grinned foolishly and waved. As the last troop carrier in the line howled past, Alex was about to move into the street, but McCall touched his shoulder. Wait a little, lad. Then Alex, too, heard what McCall had heard. A familiar and unmistakable hiss, wheeze, thump of machinery in motion. Battle mechs. The lead mech was a wasp, painted head to foot in the home guard's black and yellow colors. Despite the paint, the machine, Alex could plainly see, was not in particularly good working condition. Large streaks of rust or corrosion had been merely painted over, and they showed through the paint now like patches of decay. Missing access panels revealed clusters of brightly colored wire or bundles of myomer, weak chinks in the mech's armor. Still, even as a mech warrior, especially as a mech warrior, Alex had rarely been in a position to confront a potentially hostile mech from this vantage point, unarmed and in the open, as the machine towered above him. The Wasp was a twenty-tonner, 
standing eight meters tall, just over four times Alex's height. Though the machine was basically humanoid in design, the legs were longer than the rather squat torso. Alex would have had to stretch to reach up and touch its knee. The head, ridiculously tiny, haloed by its array of four duotech com antennas, mimicked human expression as it swung to scan the two humans standing at the side of the road. As the slit of its viewpoint swung to face them, Alex could see the neurohelmeted head of the pilot squeezed into the mech's tiny cockpit. So cramped was the pilot's space in a wasp that only his head and shoulders extended up and out of the mech's torso. The impression was more that of a man wearing a very large suit of armor than piloting a combat machine. With a ponderous clanking and a squeak chirp of metal chafing metal, the wasp strode past, following the hovercraft troop carriers. During the trip from Glengarry, McCall had used the dropship's com equipment to play a recording of the news broadcast he'd downloaded from the net. Alex wondered if this was the same wasp that had stomped on that lone protester in Malcolm Plaza. Looks like they're headed for the park, Alex said. Aye, lad, you don't often see battle max used for crowd control. Looked like a whole infantry battalion as well. Things must be pretty bad. Aye, lad, and getting worse. We can go this way. Once they were clear of the area near the spaceport, New Edinburgh became less threatening and less claustrophobic. The citizens in the streets seemed much the same as those of any other world Alex had visited. Perhaps a quarter of the men wore kilts displaying a variety of colorful tartans, while many of the women wore trues, loose-fitting slacks in patterns of plaid. There were no soldiers in evidence. Malcolm Plaza was a much larger and better-kept park than the one near the spaceport, and it seemed peaceful enough at the moment. Nevertheless, Alex noticed several telltale signs of battle. The pockmark craters of bullet holes on a ferrocrete wall, and a thin brownish stain on the street, not yet entirely washed or worn away. Beyond the plaza was the terminal for a monorail system, part of the same network as the subway near the spaceport. Still lugging the baggage, Alex and McCall paid their fares, climbed aboard a waiting maglev transport, and within minutes were silently streaking through the heart of the city, past the encircling belts of manufactories and light industrial plants, and into the rolling green countryside beyond. Pretty country, Alex said, leaning back in the maglev's car seat, and staring at the scenery drifting past. Aye, that it is. Are you happy to be back? I might be, McCall admitted. I would be in different circumstances, certainly, if we didn't have that to contend with. He pointed out the window. Turning, Alex saw the citadel for the first time. It was a structure much like the castle back on Glengarry with architecture fairly typical of the early centuries of the Star League. It was hard to see details at this distance, but it hugged the top of a cliff overlooking the chrome and glass towers of New Edinburgh like some immense carnivorous black cat crouching above its prey. Most of it looked like it had been carved and polished from a titanic block of obsidian, for it drank the light of Caledonia's yellow-orange sun without giving up a single reflection. Towers stretched skyward from the perimeter wall. Once they had housed powerful sensor suites, planetary defense beam projectors, and anti-dropship weapons. Now, they most likely housed human sentries and observers, for on Caledonia, as on so many other worlds throughout the inner sphere, the relentless loss of all technologies over the past centuries of unrelenting warfare had inevitably forced a greater and greater reliance on human sensors, rather than on electronics. Quite a fortress, Alex said. How do you get up there, anyway? Oh, there's a road of sorts. Winds up through those hills below the main cliff. Looks like it would be hard to attack. Aye, its designers had that in mind, no doubt. There's only one way in on the ground, 
and that across a stone bridge over a sheer drop of thirty meters or so. The outer walls are ferrocrete and twenty meters tall. Not tall enough, perhaps, to stop a mech with jump jets, but there's precious few places outside to boost from that are close enough for a mech to make a controlled jump. The foundation of the thing is a native bedrock, melted out of the heart of the mountain. Mount Alba, we call it. Alba? White? The mountain was a dusky purple-gray, even in full sunlight, and seemed darker beneath the black embrace of the Star Lake Fortress. Eh? Oh, aye, you're thinking of the Latin word, Albus. Nay, Alba is an old Gaelic word for Scotland. Could have been from Latin originally, I suppose, but that was a long, long time ago. The maglev monorail swept through a shadow-dark patch of forest that blotted out the view of the citadel. When it emerged into full light once more, they were already slowing for the town of Dundee. A rural town of low crystal domes and organic buildings that looked more like they'd been grown than built, Dundee lay nestled along a bay on the Firth of Lorne, sheltered from Caledon's occasional Coriolis storms by the grey-brown loom of the rugged Isle of Mull. The hills encircling the city to the north and west rose swiftly to saw-toothed peaks that were snow-capped throughout the world's entire year and sunlight off the Nevian glacier struck white fire from those slopes on any clear and sunny day. The Macaulay Estates were in the hills to the northeast, overlooking both the town and the bay. A twenty-minute ride in a rented ground car brought them to the ornate front gates. "'Good Lord, Major!' Alex said as they pulled up, seeing nothing visible beyond the gate except woods and steeply sloping hills. You gave up living here to become a mercenary? There were extenuating circumstances, Alex. McCall flashed a wry grin. Besides, I always was a rebel. The elderly gatekeeper who came out to meet them wore civilian clothing, but the sash running from left shoulder to right hip gave him a distinctly military air, despite his obvious years. The sash was woven in the rather severe red and black tartan of Clan McCall. Seeing the face of the man at the ground car's control stick, his eyes widened and his jaw dropped. Young Davis! he exclaimed. You're back! Aye, Miles, I am. Are they expecting me on the hill, do you think? I didn't call ahead when we grounded. Not for a couple of weeks, at least, sir. Ah, oh, no, they got your transmission before you left Glengarry, though. They was talking about it and little else for a week. What do you think? A friendly reception? Or like last time? Friendly enough, I imagine, sir, though you're no doubt aware that there was some wee disagreement about your maimers calling you at first. I can imagine. Any word about Angus? Nothing, sir, except that a trial's yet to be held. There's a high new trouble in the city, though, and Wilmarth's dungeons must be fair overflowing by now. I can imagine. We came through a wee bit of disturbance on the way here, too. The gatekeeper looked from McCall's face to Alex, then back again. And this is your aide, you said, young Alex Carlyle? That he is, Miles. Well, you two can go on through then. I'll call ahead and let them ken you're coming up. A servant? Alex asked as the gates swung open and McCall guided the ground car through. A retainer, and I more than that. Miles has been with the family for as long as I can remember. He's always been a good friend to me. He grinned. He helped me get out on my own when I needed some fresh air, back when I was a bairn. Just how many retainers does your family have? And how should I know that, lad? It's been a few years since I was last here. The house lay deep in the woods. A series of beams and saucer shapes, thrusting from the sheer-sided cliff, and extending out into the air above a step-like cascade of small waterfalls, 
in the rocky stream below. Alex, a tall, attractive woman in her mid-forties, was descending a curved sweep of steps as the car pulled to a stop beneath an overhanging awning. They said you were on your way. It's good to see you again. Hello, Marta. Come on in. The others are waiting for you inside. Well, might as well go on and face the music then. Hey, Marta. This is Alex Carlyle, my aide and protege. Alex, allow me to present the loveliest of the McCall lovelies, Marta. She was daft enough to marry my brother Robert some years back, but that was I after I was long gone, so she bears me no ill will, at least as far as I know. Idiot, she said smiling, and the daftest of the lot of us besides. Come on, there's no ill will here now, not with what's happened to Angus. The others were two men, younger than Davis, but displaying a distinct similarity in the angles of jaw and brow, in the sharp thrust of nose, in the cold blue-gray of eyes. Davis introduced them as his younger brothers, Robert and Ben. Besides Marta, three other women were there, Julia and Crystal, the wives of Ben and Angus, and an elderly woman whom Davis introduced as Mamer. "'And your regiment, Davis?' the old woman said as McCall completed the introduction. "'Will it be coming soon, then?' "'No, Mamer, Davis said. "'It's just me and the lad here.' Her face hardened. "'Is that all, then? And how is it you propose to take on Wilmarth and his whole army of off-world foreigners, eh? With you two hands?' We know our message to you was cut off, Ben McCall said, with only a trace of the lilting Scots burr. But we thought you'd have sense enough to bring your unit, Davis. Those people up in the Citadel are playing for keeps. Aye, Ben, McCall said reasonably, and so am I. We don't need the great death to rouse such a beggar as Nelson Wilmarth, even if bringing them here were possible. Yes. Robert said with just a trace of smugness. Your people are mercenaries, aren't they? We'd need to come up with quite a bit of money to hire them, I suppose. We do have some resources, you may remember. How much would you ask, Davis? How much to help your own family? Davis scowled. Robert, the Grey Death is not mine to give. But do you truly believe you need to purchase me services? Please, boys. Marta said, pleading in her voice. Let's not fight, not now. Robert, Davis came here to help. It's not like he has a battle mech regiment of his own to order around like his own personal army. Aye, Ben said. It's Wilmarf who has that, and we have precious little of our own to face him with. He shook his head hopelessly. He looked at McCall and at Alex, a rueful expression on his face. I don't imagine either of you has been able to bring a battle mech with you. We need an army, Ben, Robert said, and I don't know where we're supposed to find one. Well, McCall said slowly, it seems to me you have the beginnings of one right here in New Edinburgh. We saw a group as we came in. What? Robert said. That rabble? Hardly an army. Street demonstrators and gutter sweepings, the lot of them. You'd be surprised with just what you can do with gutter sweepings, McCall said. But our first job will be easier than that. What? Crystal said. She was a severe-looking woman with a heart set to her jaw. What is it you plan to do, Davis? Why, lass, McCall said cheerfully. I think that first thing tomorrow, Alex here and I are going to pay a courtesy call to our friend Wilmarf. What? We're going to the Citadel? Alex asked. Aye, unless you think we'd be better off inviting him here. Somehow, though, I don't think he'll come. Are you as daft as that, then? Robert asked. Folks around here don't go to that place, not voluntarily, and those that do go... Well, they don't usually come back. Crystal gave a stifled sob, 
then rose and rushed out of the room. Damn you, Robert! Julia said as she hurried after the other woman. I heard you and Ben went there after Angus was taken, McCall said in that awkward silence that followed. Aye, Ben said, we did, but they wouldn't let us through the front gate. They told us that Angus would be held for trial, that he would be an example for all of Caledonia, and that there was nothing we could do about it. Who'd you talk to? A guard? Actually, it was Wilmarf's chief liaison with the Fedcom military, Robert said. A poisonous toad of a man called Falker. Falker, eh? McCall said, eyes narrowing. That wouldn't be a particular toad named Kellen Falker, would it be? Major Kellen Falker, Ben said, nodding. That was him. What, do you know him? He was not a major when I knew him last, McCall said. But then neither was I. Yes, I know Killer Kellen very well indeed. Is that good? Alex asked. I mean, can you talk to him? Get him to let us in to see the governor? I'll just see what I can do, McCall said slowly, thoughtfully. It may be that our acquaintanceship will do just that little thing. Yes? Unless, of course, one of us kills the other first. 